Jerus started in 2000, I think it was, sort of unofficially, or 2000 and, 2001. Uh, I was in a band before that that uh, wasn't really doing anything and was just kind of going through the motions of being a band and um, quite by accident I ended up meeting Dan, the guitar player. Well, basically, I think me and Adam sort of throughout the summer of 2001, we had decided that we wanted to form a band together. We'd made friends just sort of before that. I remember we wrote songs all the time. We recorded them on this really shitty little Tascam four track um, recorder. There wasn't really a band as such. It was just a year of me and him um, just writing these songs and just recording them in his bedroom and stuff. And then we both went into Canterbury one day. We went into a shop called Richard's Records, which was kind of a cool place to get like pretty underground records. And uh, a guy there who worked there called Chris, um, sold me a video of a festival called Hellfest and you had like Shy Halud, Converge, Bane, uh, Buried Alive were on there, Walls of Jericho, Poison the Well, Reach the Sky, um, all these awesome hardcore bands and me and Adam used to watch it religiously and then we, we spoke to Ricky who was a, a mutual friend as well and said look we should put a band together and we wanted to do something like that, like something heavy and aggressive. And so the three of us were just kind of coming up with ideas and going to each other's houses and things like that and writing and stuff. At the same time, a local band called Dead Life Portrait split up and their drummer Simon was a really good friend of mine. And so we asked him to form a band with us. At first it was just the four of us, I think for maybe two or three months. We were rehearsing um, at Cape Paul Fern in this converted barn and it was just the four of us. And then uh, after I think a couple of practices decided we needed another guitarist and the only man for the job sort of as far as I was concerned was James who I'd been in a band with previously. And then they were looking for another guitarist and I used to be in a band with Dan before that, just like a teenage band. And I wasn't too interested in doing like heavy stuff. After that, I kind of, I think we'd been together for a couple of years and I kind of had enough of doing it. I wanted to do something else. Eventually, James, I mean, we asked James to join um, like right from the start, but I think because he'd been in a band previous to that, he had sort of misgivings about playing heavy music. But I sort of persuaded him and persuaded him and then played him a, a demo tape that I'd recorded on a little four track tape machine and he really liked it. I knew Simon was drumming in the band and um, I knew he was pretty much the best drummer I'd seen. I remember he went absolutely nuts when he, when he came to the practice. Yeah, so, and, and that was it. I went to the first rehearsal and uh, you know, I go into it straight away and I was like, oh, actually, I'd love to do this. Um, the, just all of it, it just sort of really came together and we all went absolutely ballistic and it was really loud. Simon's drumming was amazing. That was kind of how we started. That was the sort of, you know, the sort of the initial seed of the thing. And uh, that was that. Jerus was formed and that would have been October 2001, so nearly 10 years ago. First gig we ever played was at this club in Folkestone called the Harp Club, which was um, this real down and out uh, rock pub, for lack of a better word, in Folkestone. Which was April 2002. Um, that was amazing because we, I mean, we'd, we'd managed to build up quite a bit of buzz, I think, to be honest, largely due to Simon, because his previous band, Dead Life Portrait, were very popular and people knew that he was an amazing drummer. But I remember it being really, really busy. And loads and loads of people turned out for it, which was just amazing, because we'd been rehearsing for about a year previous to that and writing and kind of just living in this real insular bubble where no one but the band was kind of allowed in. And then finally we're on, our, uh, on a stage playing our stuff to people. And it was just amazing. It was like, I just remember coming off stage and like talking to everyone after it's like, it's fucking brilliant, I could do that for the rest of my life. I think we sold, I think it was 69 copies of our demo at that one show as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the first gigs were just um, 
they were really, really, I mean, we were very, very well rehearsed. So when we played live, we were tight, but there was, I don't know, there was this really quasi-violent atmosphere to it all. It was just chaos, some of the early shows. And it was, and people loved it. And, you know, the crowd were really getting involved and there was kind of like the crowd and us were just sort of merging, you know. Um we would play and people would always be like blown away and we, we went completely over the top. We'd go absolutely nuts every time we played and word got around pretty quickly and we did a lot of shows with a lot of sort of like Canterbury hardcore bands like uh, Eurotsuki Doji, Winter in June, we played with sort of the uh, very early incarnation of November Coming Fire, um, Canaan, like we did a, a couple of shows. We played a couple of Canterbury like hardcore shows and um, word got about pretty quickly. I remember we played throughout the year steadily, kept recording um, and just played consistently sort of up and down the country for all that year and then... And then a, a guy I knew called Owen Packard who was, he played guitar in a band called Earth Tone 9 who were a sort of late 90s, early millennium uh, kind of heavy slash progressive band, Earth Tone 9 having split up, Owen had formed a PR company and offered to do PR for Jairus. It was us and a band called Vacant Stare were the first two bands on, it was Hero PR it was called, and he sent our disc out to a load of people, including a kid called Marcus Hamblet, who was about 15 at the time, and he absolutely loved our first demo which, you know, at, at the time, again, it was new and exciting, but you listen to it now and it's, it's horrendous. Um, but he listened to it and he passed it to Skipworth Records. This guy called Skippy got in contact with us who ran Skipworth Records. And he was really, really interested in the band. And I think initially he wasn't going to sign us because he was already booked up for the rest of the year with this band for Dire Life's Sake and this band from Holland called Deluge. So initially he wasn't actually in a position to sign us because he was kind of busy with these other two projects. I just remember Dan saying, yeah, Skip is interested in, in the band, you know, they're a good, uh, good record label and he's going to come along to this gig in um, Islington. The Hope and Anchor in Islington, and it was like a little venue in the basement. That was kind of cool because you, like The Cure have played there and The Smiths and a lot of bands that we're into. And he come along and we met him uh, in the pub beforehand and uh, had a little drink with him and, you know, I remember being a little bit nervous because I was thinking, OK, we could potentially get signed from this or not. But he came and he loved the band and this was on the 30th of December 2002. I remember being really loud, really, like, really loud and it sounded great and Again, we just went off on one, but this time it sounded awesome, and it was a tiny little venue, and we we just played our hearts out. I probably fell over a few times, and you know, but I remember really going, we, but all of us really going for it, and we played a good show. And I think um, on the strength of that, Skippy was impressed enough. I remember it because the night after, which was New Year's Eve, he phoned me and he said, "I want to sign the band." after he'd, he'd, we'd given him the demo at the show, he'd got home, listened to it, and he said, like, I want you to do an album. And I remember going to the other guy, we were all having this massive, like, New Year's Eve piss up at, at James's house. And I said to him, like, we've been signed, like, we're gonna do an album. And of course, everyone just went, oh, like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a great new year. I think we all kind of knew that once we, um sign with Skipworth that we didn't want to kind of do the the usual route that a hardcore band or a punk rock band would take which is to kind of you know you do an EP and then you kind of try and build on your fan base and then you like slip the full length in there we just rather bloody mindedly went straight for the full length album. Map Maker was what well, was our first album um, probably I would say probably the most exciting time of my life um, up, and, up, up until that point, um, that was the best thing I'd ever done. That we started writing again in, in this, this barn in Capel. Um, 
quite hard work, and it takes quite a while to write songs. Well, for us it does. Um, back then I remember this especially. We then moved to James's mum, very kindly built us a rehearsal studio on the side of a big house she had in Saltwood. And then we moved there and we spent the first, I would say, six, seven months of 2003 writing the rest of that record. I think we had about four good songs that we wanted to put on the record and then we had to get together about six songs, I think. So we just, you know, we were, we were writing and writing and writing. Although some of the songs, Luco Sleeps on Screen, which is the first song, and Wilhelmina, we'd written literally a couple of nights before we recorded it. Yeah, we recorded with um, Ben Phillips um, in his first kind of makeshift studio in his flat in Gillingham. He'd never really like done any recording before. When I met him at college, he'd just sort of done a bit of recording of his own band, but I really liked his recordings, and we, we sort of you know, said to him, we want you to record us. The, the recording experience was good, because we were all kind of quite friendly with him. Found him quite funny, he's quite a funny guy. And we did it over a period of, I reckon, maybe... We started it in August 2003, and I think it was finished around October, like maybe November, but I think by October. But it was done in bits and scraps. It was a bit of a headache because I think Simon wanted to use drum triggers. But then we ended up like with some of the toms being mic'd, but the floor tom being triggered. So you'll hear whenever he hits the floor tom, it's this real like horrible clicky sort of sound. And I think we recorded a load of drum tracks that were fantastic. And then Simon decided he wanted to go out and buy a new snare drum. And so we had to re-record all the drums with it because the snare drum sound was completely different. Matt Maker was supposed to be, if I've got this right, it was supposed to be recorded in three weeks. And it ended up going on for something like three months because we were trying to get it right. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so keen on the production now, um, certain things. But I like it for what it is and I liked what we did with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud, I'm, I'm very proud of the album. I mean, for all of its kind of faults and stuff, it's, it's a really, really honest record and it totally encapsulates um, where we were as people at the time and it was right around that time that the first kind of proper tours were starting to be booked. In fact, 2004 was probably the best year we had, the touring and support of, of Matt Maker. Well, Skip, uh, Skipworth was a European label, and he had a lot of contacts in Europe as well. First tour, um, it was European one to France, and we did that with Second Smile. I remember falling over quite badly in that one in, in front of a load of really attractive French girls. They were just standing there, and I, I absolutely stacked it in front of them. So I've got good memories of that tour. In 2004, we played like the Fredericia Hardcore Fest in Denmark, Mark with like Heaven Shall Burn, Himza, The Haunted, bands like that. We played an amazing festival in Spain with Pelican, Girls Against Boys played Stamping Ground, Last Days of April, um, loads of bands, loads of bands. We, we got to play with loads of bands we were really into that year. We played, played with Shai Halud um, at the garage, their sort of last ever show with Git doing vocals. That was amazing. I think it was their last show with Git singing for them, and they asked Jerris to support them there. Which was really, really weird because we started to get all these um, death threats 
on all these um, punk uh, message forums online. Because, because we were a bit melodic and uh, but some people thought we didn't deserve to be playing um, you know, with a band like Shy Haluk, who were an, an iconic hardcore band at the time. Well, they were literally posting things on there like they were going to wait for us after the show with baseball bags and like get us and stuff. So I was really, really nervous. But needless to say, it was amazing. Like nobody kicked off. It was one of the best shows we've played. Like Gear very kindly um, thanked us for supporting um, them and for making it such a memorable show, which it was. And that, I think, kind of cemented in a lot of those kind of more tough guy hardcore kids that actually, regardless of or not of whether they like the music or not, we were actually doing it for quite honest reasons and stuff. So subsequently, nothing happened and it all kind of worked out. Uh, I think we did our first tour where we had to board a plane, which was a really big deal. Getting to Heathrow at like four o'clock in the morning flying out to Latvia and there just being like snow everywhere. Um, Latvia was great because it was a country I barely even heard of, you know, and we got um, our contact Edgar's from um, Skippy. First gig is a snowboarding festival or something like that, or some sort of ski thing. And um, yeah, we just sort of got off the plane, turned up there, had a sound check, sounded good. The venue looked pretty nice, quite a big venue this time, it was bigger. About 500 people, and just got just got packed out. And like we played, and people, it was like your quintessential great gig, you know, like uh, like crowd surfing, people jumping off the stage, and uh, everyone singing along to your songs, which was weird because it was the first time I'd ever been there. I didn't even realise anyone really knew who we were there. But uh, and at the end, everyone was chanting our name, and we went backstage. And, I remember, I remember turning around to Ricky, our bass player at the time, just thinking, what's going on? You know, just chanting our name. It's just like, we were a bit like, oh, do, we, do we go back out there? We haven't got any more songs to do, we have to repeat. I remember, actually, we, we played in we did a show in Estonia in about, this would be probably February 04, and it was this weird punk gig. It was full of these real old school, diehard kind of crusty punks with the, the Mohican and the leather jacket and all that kind of stuff. And they had a big like banner with Sid Vicious on it at the back and all these really awful bands. And the gear that was supposed to be hired for us for the tour, we couldn't pick up until the next night. And so they had these tiny little practice amps for us to play through. And I remember they gave me a boss metal zone, like distortion pedal. We played this show, then some kind of like fight broke out backstage because this, uh, I think this guy had accused us of like stealing his drugs or something like that. So it all kind of got a bit tense backstage. We didn't, by the way. Didn't Ricky lob a TV out of a window yeah. as well? But he didn't, it, not in the traditional rock and roll, like straight through the glass. He just sort of dropped it like out of a window that was about that high. That was as, about as rock and roll as Jairus ever got. But on the way back, we drove through the snow blizzard. Um, and then I remember waking up and it was about 7 a.m. And Simon and Skippy had made the driver stop the van because they'd bought a sledge while we were in Estonia. And they'd seen a big hill that they wanted to try it out on. And we're like, we were all in the van asleep. You know when you just wake up and you're like, what's going on? Where am I? It was freezing cold. The van door was open. There's all like snowflakes blowing in. And it's like, I think James was like, what the hell's going on? And we looked out and you can just hear this like gleeful laughter in the distance. And like Simon going down this fucking great big hill on a sledge and Skippy filming him. Um, and the driver just sort of standing there, like rolling his eyes, and everyone going, what the hell are you doing? It's seven o'clock in the morning. We want to go back to Latvia and go to this apartment and go to sleep. But funnily enough, the next night, they left the sledge on top of the van and the driver drove off. And they realized when we got down the road and we turned back and someone had run the sledge over in their car and it was all in bits. And Simon and Skippy were devastated. And uh, so, every cloud. <laughs> Through Skipworth, 
We were also kind of signed up to Alliance Tracks, which is the Japanese label. We did the Japan tour in December 04, which I would say was, well, well from my uh, view, like the best tour that we had done, best experience as a band. Yeah, Japan was amazing. My memory, my initial memory of Japan is um, is meeting up with James before we went because we were so excited to be going to Japan because it was also sort of first time and new. Um, but we went um, we went out that night and we were out for we had to catch this ridiculous flight. It's like two o'clock in the morning, so there was no point in going to sleep. So me and James went out and like kind of painted the town red and smoking cigars and all that kind of stuff. I think it was about. 13 and a half, 14 hour flight or something like that. We stepped off the plane. It was like being in Blade Runner or something. Tokyo was just so huge and this kind of big sprawling metropolis. It was a real eye opener and fantastic to kind of, you know, step out of Kent and into Japan. Going out there was, it was you know, it was a lot more kind of serious and professional. You know, it wasn't just like getting a van and piss around and just, you know, drive over to Europe. It was, there was quite a lot of money involved with the tickets and everything. And like um, Alliance Tracks, um, Daiki, the guy who runs it, or on it, he um, got loads of merch made up for us and stuff. So we got out there and there was all this like merch laid on for us and like vans already sorted. And, you know, it was, it was all very professional. And the shows were really good as well. First three were difficult because um, we were really horribly jet lagged and it was really hard to kind of find the energy to do the performances. But I think after about the third night, we sort of hit our stride. And I, and I, remember, really think, I remember thinking at that point, like, you know, we're really on something good because we we're in our early 20s and we've managed to get out of here just through, you know, our own backs, just from our music, you know, just because enough people wanted to see us out there. Some of the days off on that tour were amazing as well. We visited this Zen monastery in Kyoto, which was an extraordinary experience, just to see something of that beauty and perfection. And to be there with your sort of, uh, your best friends, people that you've kind of like grown up with and done all these incredible things with, it was just great. And I remember going to, um, well, all of us going to HMV in the center of Tokyo and finding our, our album in there, which was sold out. It just, it just had the Jairus, you know, like label on it. We were sold out, so we were all pretty pleased about that. I think it was after we got back from Japan, or a little while after we got back from Japan, was when we made the decision to go with BSM. So we left Skipworth, I'd say, in about March 05 and signed to BSM. Uh, the first thing we did for BSM was a four-track EP, which was recorded in May 2005. But we, you know, we, we presented it to him and he said, well, you know, it's a bit hard to kind of promote an EP, you know, we really should need to do an album. And he was like, well, well, yeah, you could have told us that. Signing with BSM was one of the worst mistakes this band ever made because they didn't really understand the band. And one does get the feeling that they, they kind of knew the overall narrative that was starting to spring up around the band at the time, but they weren't particularly interested. It was more that they, they just wanted the name associated with their label. Um, yeah, we went through how. Um, we, well, we did the, did the BSM EP, did a tour in Eastern Europe in October and took out Second Smile and Meet Me in St. Louis. The tour, some of the shows, well the last couple of shows were great but it was really badly organised um, just to, due to the individual promoters as opposed to our booking agent. You know, there, I think there were 18 of us including the driver and Kev from BSM and his friend travelling in one van with a trailer on the back of it 
Like we were never getting, the promoters weren't providing enough food for that many people, like people were getting sick. Um, it was really, really hard. And at the end of that tour, Ricky decided to go traveling. Um, but I mean, we, we didn't know about like he, he sort of, I think he was going within a few days of the end of the, end of the tour. Which was a real, real shock because we actually had a tour lined up for as soon as we got back. The idea was we got back from Latvia, had I think a two week break and then we were heading out um, through England again. But it was, I mean, it was really hard on us because, you know, we've all known each other for so long and, you know, ever, as far as we were concerned, the, the band was still pushing forward, um, but he, for some reason felt the need to kind of pull out and do his own thing, which left us in a bit of a bind because it was like, not only did we have to cancel all these tours and all these shows, but we were effectively without a bass player. And to be honest, it had like, you know, like I don't blame them by that point. It, it felt like we'd kind of reached our high point and it had kind of dipped a bit. Like the EP, nothing was done with it. It was never available anywhere. Uh, the excitement that we had around Mapmaker just wasn't, you know, like people loved the record, but, you know, the people promoting it and working on it, you know, didn't, we felt that they didn't seem that interested in it. So we were stuck without a bass player and fortunately Oz uh, stepped in and he was rehearsing with us and playing shows with us. Um, because it now, there was this kind of different dynamic in the band. So. Jerris were kind of stuck in this position where we didn't really know how to kind of keep going. We knew we wanted to sort of move forward and we knew we wanted to progress as a band, but we weren't entirely sure how to do it. And I think the shock of Ricky sort of leaving made everything kind of very uncertain for us. That and coupled with the fact that the EP was so sort of disappointingly handled by BSM. It, um, it was the start of, what later turned out to be some quite real problems within the dynamic of the band. This is, I think at this point, it's like when things kind of started to change. Um... Shortly after that, because Oz was never supposed to be a permanent member anyway, he was just sort of standing in to help us out, and that's when Mike joined the band, which was great because Mike came in with this real sense of enthusiasm, and it kind of helped get our confidence up a little bit more because he was, you could tell he was kind of committed to it and he was really trying to kind of like fit in and like, you know, learn the parts and we were starting to get back into being a band and doing the kind of things that bands do. And that's when Simon left the band. So after, after um, Simon, we tried out a few drummers. We had Ben, Ben Phillips play for a while. We did like, we went to Eastern Europe and um, Europe as well, I think. Although, um, I didn't feel we were as tight as a band at that point. Because, so, you know, like, Ricky had gone and Simon had now gone. So the lineup was quite different. Um, I think we're kind of still getting used to that. And um, um, we then decided that Ben wasn't the right drummer for the band and uh, sort of went our separate ways. And then that's when uh, Doug came in. Doug actually expressed an interest in joining Jarrus uh, right at the moment that Simon uh, left. I'm not entirely sure why he was, um, why Ben was chosen over him. I originally got in touch when um, Simon left the band and uh, they had just found Ben before me, but then when that didn't work out, like Dan just gave me a call and was just, asked if I was still up for, for getting involved, so I came down and uh, had a jam and it worked out. We tried, I think we tried like a couple of other people, but um, like Doug was definitely, definitely the right man to, to pick, definitely. Doug joined in about April 07. We, carry, we basically finished off what we'd been writing with Ben and recorded an album during the summer of 2007 called A Second Tier Protest, which we recorded with our friend Oz again. But I would say by this point, I mean, we had all lost interest. It was sort of dead on it. We'd been through like, I mean, we'd been through a couple of lineup changes that, but that had had a, a big, big impact on the band. 
we'd completely changed our sound and I don't know if deep down any of us were really happy with it. It was, I suppose, a desperate attempt to try and make the bands like fun again. It was quite different. It wasn't, it was Jairus, but not traditionally Jairus. I remember trying to kind of really push things like musically a little bit more. Um, but I think in the end we listened to it and it just, it didn't sound quite right. And in the end we weren't confident enough to kind of release it because we thought this isn't, this isn't actually, um, it's all really generous. I don't know, it, it, was, it felt different but not maybe not in such a, a good way, you know, not like a kind of natural progression, different, it, it maybe a bit forced. The problem with it was, was that we kind of mistook experimentation as a direction in and of itself and actually it was pretty aimless I mean it was we were it's very much when I listen to those recordings now because I still have some of them for fuck's sake we it just seemed like we totally lost confidence in what it was we did in the first place so we were kind of pushing ourselves in this other direction but it was um, it was fairly aimless, if I'm honest. Um, and even now, when I kind of listen back to some of those recordings, when I feel brave enough to listen back to some of those recordings, it really does sound like a band which is lacking any direction. And we were really dragging our feet in a massive way. I, I don't know, man. Like, the songs, they, they weren't right. I mean, I've, I kind of joined the band, and like, I must admit, I was pretty disappointed with the stuff we were writing. I wasn't really in a, in a place to say how I felt about the songs because obviously it was, I was new and like, you know, it was more their, their kind of thing and I was just, you know, not so much helping out but like they'd already made a start on it. I wasn't going to kind of join and say I'm, I'm not really into this, do you know what I mean? You know, beggars can't be choosers. And um, It was a really difficult time, I think, for all of us. All of us were having stuff going on Personally, I was really misbehaving at the time in various ways. And I was just starting to run out of steam with the whole thing. Um, round about the time that Second Deer Protest was being recorded was when I published um, my first book, Building a Bridge of Burning Brick. And um, at the time, I just felt like I was becoming more interested in some of the other things I was doing outside of music, like writing and making art. So I'd round about that time uh, just entered into art college. And I um, had just moved into um, a flat that I was sharing with my cousin Matthew, who's also a painter. And it just seemed like I was kind of getting more fulfillment out of uh, making art and writing. And that's when I made the decision to basically just leave the band, because I just had enough of it. I'd just run out of steam. And I'd been on this cycle of touring and recording and touring. I'd watched friends come and go, and it just seemed like this endless cycle that um, was becoming increasingly hard to motivate myself towards continuing and as honest as I can be I just kind of lost interest I mean it was really really hard because I didn't want to let anyone down and uh, I didn't exactly pick the best moment to do it either because it was right after we finished the recording for a second tier process or actually it might have been the perfect moment because um, I'm really really glad that that record never came out it's not it doesn't, I don't know, it just, it just never had the, the authority behind it that the other um, material we released did. So I just left the band and didn't really speak to them for a while after that either because it was kind of an awkward situation. We'd effectively grown up around each other and we lived so much of our lives together at that point that it was, it was really, really difficult. It was tantamount to a divorce on some level. Um, they weren't very happy with me and uh, needless to say I was slightly embarrassed by the situation so I just kind of disappeared 
into um, uh, studying fine art with my tail tucked between my legs. And that I think I probably didn't speak to any of the guys for about four or five months. That was it, really. You know, Adam, me and Adam formed GRS. Um, well, we, I'm sorry, me, Adam and Ricky formed Jairus. Uh, it was mine and Adam's initial idea to start this hardcore band and um, without him in it, like it just wouldn't have been Jairus anymore. So that was that. We, we packed it in and we formed an instrumental, but the remaining members formed an instrumental band called Papillons. We got Alex on keyboards, uh, a really old friend of mine. Um, yeah, and we heard like he was quite into doing you know, like keyboards and synth and that kind of stuff, and we kind of we kind of always wanted that because um, we, um, Ricky, our bass player, and Simon always messed around with samples and stuff like in our sets and just kind of little things, you know. But and we always quite liked that element that it gave that kind of more atmospheric sound. And a lot of my guitar parts, even now, like you know, they're kind of quite reverb drenched like atmospheric parts because you know we like that sound and to have an actual kind of like keyboard synth player in the band would, would be great. So Dan invited me over to a practice um, and we just sort of picked up from there. I liked the music, I liked what they were doing. Um, it was a lot mellower than, than what we're doing at the moment. So it's something really wrong with sort of the national um, things of that, owls. It was really, it was nice, it was good music. I really enjoyed playing it but it just never was really going anywhere. Um, we couldn't sort out a singer in time. And I just don't think everyone's heart was really in it, unfortunately, which is a bit of a shame. Like, we, you know, the rest of us didn't want to stop playing music together, so we still carried on doing something. It was, um, didn't really interest me that much, like, if I'm honest. Like, I wasn't, I think we were just kind of doing it just because we didn't want to stop playing music together, but musically, I don't know. I don't think it was, I don't think it was what I, I thought we were capable of doing something a little bit more interesting than what we were coming up with then. Um, and I think it was around about Christmas of 2008 that um, I got this phone call from Dan uh, and he just told me that he'd been out to America with this band Unwed Sailor. He'd been touring over the, uh, in the States with them and, um, and mine and Dan's relationship at the time was quite difficult because it um, it was quite acrimonious round about, round about the time that I left the band and um, he just told me over the phone that while he was out there he was it was particularly miserable tour experience I think for him and um, he essentially said to me you know life's too short and we've got all this 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 kind of history together and you know we sort of met up with a cup of tea over a cup of tea and you know sort of got our relationship sort of back on track round about that time. So after about a pretty non-eventful 2008, I mean, nothing happened for us. Adam was off at art college. In early January 2009, I tried phoning Dan up and as it turns out, he was on tour with, uh, around Europe with Unwed Sailor again. And I was desperately trying to call him and I thought for some reason he was ignoring me. I'm like calling him every like half an hour at some point and when I did finally manage to get hold of him, that's when I told him, I said, look, um, you know, I've just been thinking about things a lot and I really think that, um, that that band is too good to give up on. Adam called me and he's just like, look, I want to reform JRS. Um, James took a little bit of convincing because I think out of all of us, um, and this is not to downplay the feelings of everyone else, but I think he was the one whose feelings were the most hurt about the band splitting up initially. And again, I was a little bit hesitant, you know, because I thought, well, things didn't end so great, and, you know, um, does Adam want to do it now? Like, does he really want to do it? I know for me, like, I was definitely 100% back in to do that over what we were doing in the meantime, because I was only doing it just to sort of, you know, hang out with these guys and just play, do you know what I mean? Wasn't didn't have no interest in really what we were playing. We were all unsure because we were like, are people going to care now? Um, you know, I didn't like the stuff we had written, like, in recent years. As far as I was concerned, we hadn't really done anything great since Mapmaker. 
because Alex was working with uh, Papillons as they were, I think they were kind of interested to sort of keep him as an element in it because Jerus have always had that sort of ambience in our sound as well. And the six of us met up at my house in Ashford, so we thought we'd uh, sort of uh, choose a neutral venue because I think um, Adam had seen like, a couple of guys for a while. Uh, we just had a few things to talk through, you know, make sure that what we, this is what we wanted to do and it was, was going to be serious as well. We started rehearsing again and it was just brilliant. It was fantastic. It was the tightest the band had ever sounded. We made the decision after a couple of practices to scrap all of the material from a second tier protest, the album that sort of never got finished, and that we would play older sort of you know, classic Jera songs and we'd, we'd write brand new stuff. Um. The first show we played get, um, after we got back together for me was a bit of a non-event because I was so nervous about it. I started getting a migraine before I um, went on stage. Our first gig back, I remember being really disappointed because I'd sold a lot of my gear, I sold my really nice amplifier. It was quite a, a strange set. We played it, songs like Picasso, um, which we haven't played since. Uh, completely dropped from the set pretty much. But. And I was really hoping for like a sort of climactic return in my head, you know, like we'll come back and all this nonsense will go through your head. And then the, we played the night after um, in High Wycombe the night after and that was good. That ferocity and that passion was just there again and it was just great. It just felt like Jerus again, it didn't feel like some imitation of the band we were, but just the kind of the next evolutionary step of that band. Um, but we knew that we, could, that we could be better and that we could do better as well. Okay, first bit of footage for the Jera Studio documentary. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, this is where I live. This is Bournemouth Road out here, it's nine... ish. 45 and um, I'm really tired because I only got like two hours sleep despite the uh, attempting to go to bed early for today which didn't work so I was so excited um, yeah we're, we're gonna go and make a record so uh, come with us <laughs> and uh, oh, Jesus. be a part of the uh, the magic <laughs> <laughs> first song we wrote with this lineup at Jarrah's and it was the first thing we had written in five years but I had gone like, whoa, like this is amazing. It was really exciting like writing as Jarrah's again like right especially writing heavier stuff because I guess that's kind of, it was a lot the material we started writing when we got back together was a lot more you know similar to what I was into when I was into Jarrah's originally. It was just great because it was like the first time in a long time that the band had a sense of purpose and a sense of direction so we were firing on all four cylinders and it was just exciting to be back in that environment of rehearsing and like making the records and it was good because it was so different to what we'd done before we broke up with the second album and i think it's what what we needed to do to kind of work out this is the direction we're gonna go in we played a few shows in summer 2009 with blackfish and color and 
we got an amazing reaction. Like the shows we played were packed, like people going nuts again. And it felt like, you know, a few years before, you know, five, six years before. I think everyone really gave that recording everything that they could because uh, it just felt good to be a band again. Latvia and Lithuania uh, not long afterwards as well, which was uh, an eventful tour. <laughs> I mean, it was the first time I've been out to Eastern Europe, so it was, it was really nice. The people are great, really friendly. I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I knew the band had been out there loads of times before, but didn't realise there was this big sort of groundswell of, of sort of uh, support for them out there and like loads of, really loads of fans. And because so when we played Riga, it was, uh, it was great, you know, sort of fans chanting the band's name and wearing band shirts and stuff. I had no idea they were so popular out there, so it was great, yeah. It was really cool, and um, yeah, we got put up in some good places. Um, set a place called Liapa, which is on the sort of west, um, well, it's the Baltic coast and the sort of west of the country. And uh, stayed in this crazy hotel, a place called Fontaine's Palace, run by some dissolute, fat drunkard, I think, by a bowl of plants, who just sort of appears in the early hours of the morning and starts tinkling around on the piano. Um, but I got really drunk. I think more drunk than I've ever been before. Um, it's maybe part of the reason why I'm teetotal now, but, um, and sort of proceeded to, to get naked and run around a spa and lost all my clothes. And uh, I had to walk into a hotel reception at about 10 a.m., just sort of clutching myself uh, in front of families, people checking in and checking out. So it was, it was quite embarrassing the next day when I kind of realized what had happened, but uh, these things happen. <laughs> and then we did like a, a big tour with maths. down here, then went up north, then Scotland, then kind of back down, and that was cool. It was just generally a good laugh, the tour, like, there was plenty of banter in the van, that's for sure. Um, Mike and James like to get pretty leery, so that's pretty funny. And then we decided to do a cover because we've never done anything like that as a band. Pink Floyd are definitely a massive influence on myself and Adam. You know, they're the reason I got into music, them and The Cure and Sheep by Pink Floyd was actually the song that got me and uh, Dan talking because when we first met each other we really didn't get on and I'm not entirely sure why I think we're both kind of snotty in our own sort of way um, and I think it was Dan who mentioned that he was a Pink Floyd fan. I was like oh really you like Pink Floyd cool all is forgiven you know um, and the one Pink Floyd song that we really, really identified with and talked about a lot was Sheep from the Animals album. So we'd kind of always taken it on tour with us. So yeah, we just we listened to it in Dan's car. And as soon as I, as soon as I li listened to it, even though it's about eight minutes, nine minutes long, um, I thought, well, A, it's going to be a challenge to um, learn it <laughs> for a start. And B, just kind of put our stamp on it. And it was great for me as well, with um, bold and old box Jaguar and uh, I mean, the first minute and a half was me tinkling around basically, so that was, that was cool, it was really good fun. Um, it came together pretty, pretty well actually, pretty easily, because we all just like listened up to it loads and had our own ideas, like obviously to make it heavier, more our kind of sound, so um, I think it came, over, came across quite well, hopefully, I think it did. It seemed to go down alright. <laughs> it was mixed by um, 
Andy Jackson as well, who did a lot of mastering for Pink Floyd. So that was really exciting as well, having that um, extra credibility linked to the project. And it just, I suppose it shows another side to the band, like that we can take someone else's song and make it our own and for it to, to still work. Well, I think it works anyway. If you don't, I don't care. We, we played it once as, an, as a, an encore, I suppose. Yeah, an encore, I think. That's the rock and roll term for it, but yeah. Um, yeah, there's a show earlier this year, and I think that we, we probably won't pull it out again, to be honest with you, but it was fun. It was, it was really good to play, and we managed to nail it, so that's cool. And yeah, just yeah, being a huge Floyd fan, it was, it was great to, to play that, and yeah, getting mixed, mixed by cool dudes as well, so yeah, it was good. So we did that, and have played shows ever since, like some really great shows as well. But we felt like now it's time to do a new record to spend some serious time on the writing of it rather than just sort of bashing something together quickly to spend a, a decent amount of time on the recording of it. It's still Jerus, but it's it's a lot more controlled and it's a lot more restrained and but not in that way. There's still like a kind of direction to it, and there's still like a real drive and momentum about the record. I think. Um, My opinion is that it's the strongest material we've written to date, certainly since I've been in the band. Um, so really, really happy with it and. Like what we've done so far is, is sounding good, so excited about what's to come, yeah. We've put more thought into these songs than anything we've ever done. Like they've got all of the elements of Jerus that us and outside people like. It's really, I'm really pleased with all the songs. Um, Again, it's, it's obviously quite different from Matt Maker because now you've got a span of, I don't know, like seven years or some, six, six, seven years. So it's different. Uh, obviously, you know, it's going to be slightly more mature, um, the songwriting. Um, but we, we still make sure now that we always retain, like, kind of like what we started with, you know. So it's still Jerry's elements in there a lot. It's good. So, I mean, song wise, Easily, for me, it's the best stuff we've wrote since I've been in the band. By far, like, really enjoyed the writing. Everything's been quite natural, really, with how we've wrote this stuff. It's not, it's actually come across quite quick. Um, in the sense that, you know, when we've actually rehearsed, the songs, have, we've kind of churned them out quite quick this time round. And this, this felt very natural, like the writing process on it. Um, we've never been very fortunate with booking agents and management and things like that. We've always had to sort of do everything ourselves. Um, and with, with this record, we found a label, like a, a locally based label that's just formed, that's run by three friends of ours, who we have absolute faith in, who they all love Jarus and they really, really want to push this record out there. So we just said, yeah, like, we'll do it like they're going to press it and, and promote it and we'll see what happens but this is why we've you know we got Geert van der Velde Robin! from Shy Halud to do the guest vocals Nine! because he was somebody that you know his band definitely influenced Jarrus 
to start with. On the It up. I mean, it's one of the most surreal moments of my life, having to write um, a vocal line and a lyric for someone who not only is somewhat an icon of my youth, but actually is someone I really, really respect and someone I really admire. And for him to be so um, respectful in turn to um, our recording process and to give it as much as he did and to um, really really um, try and give something that was good and beautiful um, to the recording sessions it really really does mean a lot lot to all of us. I mean it kind of happened by chance as um, Gears of a Band was in Kent I think at the time and Dan sort of got in touch offered to you know see if they wanted to come down and record and um, as they were down around the same time as we were recording, we thought we'd be a bit cheeky and see if he was keen on doing some vocals. And um, so we knocked out like a dummy version of the track to a click that we could then replay to that tempo and um, got him to do them. They, they sound really good. So he went in, like we did the melodic vocals over the end. They were, I think it was one take for, for each melodic bit, like one or two takes, note perfect. He added all these harmonies that we hadn't really thought of that just really have like lifted the track, which was nice because he could have just gone in and done what we'd asked and, and left it at that, but he, he actually put effort into it. an honour like, to record him like, and for him to be such a nice person as well. Um, but very, very surreal situation being um, with Git from Shai Halud and going over like uh, vocals with him and talking about lyrical content and stuff like that. It, it was absolutely wonderful. We thought it'd be an honour to have someone like that on the recording, so we've done that and uh, it was awesome. You know, and I think even even if nobody ever listened to this record, we'd all be able to sit there and say this is the best thing we've done and, and be happy with it. So we'll see where it takes us. We're open minded as to, to what happens, but that I mean that brings us up to now. Friday the twenty sixth of August. Anchor Baby recordings with a blue light on me.